Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Hasknecht. I'm the Associate Provost for Research and Scholarship, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our seminar today. This event is being live streamed, so I want to also welcome those of you who are joining us via live stream. Um, I'm really, really pleased to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Ron Hills. Ron is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in UNE's College of Pharmacy. Ron received his PhD in 2008 from the Scripps Research Institute in California. And at that time, he was studying theoretical simulations of protein folding. He's a pretty smart guy. He had a Goldwater scholarship at an NIH postdoctoral fellowship. And we were really fortunate to recruit him to the College of Pharmacy back in 2010. So the pharmacy school was about two years old. So he's one of our early faculty members in that college. Um, he started teaching first year biochemistry. He's been teaching that class ever since. And now he's also teaching medicinal chemistry in the pharmacy curriculum. Um, Ron has really diverse research interests. They range from the physics of cell membranes to multi-drug resistance and transport, as well as health-related scholarship. And he uses simulation tools to address these research questions. In his lab, he has students which range from undergraduates to PharmD candidates. And he is also funded by the NSF. So I want to welcome Ron as he comes to talk to us today about the science of lipids and cell membranes and health-related research. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? So how many medical students do we have here today? A few. Do we have any students from CAS, Arts and Sciences? Couple. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, I've been here a while, but I think this is my first seminar on the on the Biddeford campus. So I'm gonna try to give you a broad uh, overview of the types of things we're interested in. Try to make it relevant to the medical students. I think this might be my first seminar where there, there are no equations. So um, I think you'll appreciate that. I might bore John Stubbs a little bit though. <clears throat> okay, so I'll uh, just talk to you a little bit about my background. My training is in molecular modeling and simulation. We'll start off with. Um, I'll just vaguely introduce you know, the types of models that we, we develop in my lab. Um, but then we'll get right into the types of questions that we're interested in uh, addressing in, in biomedical research. So particularly, we'll be talking about membrane transporters. Uh, these are transporters that get drugs um, from across the, the GI barrier. But then um, also, they're involved in multi-drug resistance um, throughout the tissues. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, different lipids that the cell membranes are comprised of, and then their ph physiological relevance. And we spent time modeling different types of membranes, um, and looking at the lipid composition and how that's relevant to, to health and disease. <clears throat> um, and then we really can't talk about um, the health of cell membranes without getting into um, the GI barrier and talking about the gut microbiome. So I'll, I'll introduce a little bit of that to you. Um, but, of course, but just to remind you, my lab research is, is just computational research. So we, we try to collaborate with other people. Um, and then this summer, I've had two pharmacy students working with me on looking at um, just assessing evidence, doing a systematic review of cholesterol meds. So we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. Um, but so for my lab research, we um, develop simulation models. Um, many of the people in my field will um, look at things at the atomistic level. Um, and so that gives you kind of, uh, kind of limits you in the types of problems you can look at. Um, you can essentially look at a small box of water, maybe one membrane protein. Um, but we, we're more interested in multi-scale modeling, where we can look at bigger systems. Uh, but then you have to give up something. And what we give up is the level of resolution or detail. So instead of looking at things at the atomistic level, um, we have some, some mapping schemes. And we, we do some ensemble averaging, where we just look at the degrees of freedom of interest. So for a protein, we look at individual amino acid residues. Um, and that allows us to look at more intact membranes, larger um, complexes, and how they contribute to cell biology. <clears throat> um, and particularly the last um, several years in my lab, the proteins we've been interested in are membrane transporters, usually of the ABC variety, so ATP binding cassette proteins. Uh, but that's a diverse family. Uh, they're involved in anything from import. Um, so bacteria, the only way they get nutrients um, inside generally is through these import proteins. Uh, if you think about uh, a diabetic patient, or, sorry, a patient with diabetes, 
Um, after a meal, they need to lower their blood glucose level. So we have um, importers, uh, the, the GLUT, G-L-U-T, uh, import transporter, that's going to bring glucose inside the cell um, so that you can then um, put it through cell respiration. Uh, but they have, the, the point is these transporters are a broad family. They have diverse substrates. Uh, they range in size from ions to large peptides, uh, large for, for armines. Um, and then um, where this gets a little more interesting is that the exporters uh, are often um, have multiple substrates. So they have what's called polyspecific binding. Um, and <clears throat> they have been shown um, in different tissues, different transporters, to either be involved in multidrug resistance and antibiotics or with chemotherapy patients. Um, if you have a patient that's developing a resistance to chemotherapy, to one chem chemotherapeutic agent, agent um, generally they will, their cells will upregulate these efflux proteins, <clears throat> um, and then you become resistant to other drugs. So that's a, it's a problem with uh, multidrug resistance. Um, but we're in a college of pharmacy, so we're interested in how drugs get absorbed generally. Um, and so there's one transporter that's of particular interest that you might have heard of. It's called P-glycoprotein. Uh, it's a glycosylated protein, but we actually don't model the glycosylated regions yet. So we really don't understand um, those moieties. We just model the protein. The protein is a membrane transporter. Um, and it's, so it's, uh, it's expressed in many tissues, but it's very important in the intestinal epithelium, so in the GI barrier. Uh, it's an exporter that's pointed out into the GI lumen. So that's going to essentially decrease drug, drug absorption because drugs will generally passively diffuse. Um, into, this, into this epithelium, and then they'll get pumped back out by what's called multidrug resistance protein. It's just another name for p glycoprotein. <clears throat> uh, if you've ever uh, you know, seen on you know, a pharmacy insert um, that you might want to take this drug with a fatty meal, um, well, where that becomes into play here is that class two drugs, so these are um, lipophilic drugs that are low soluble but highly, highly permeable to the nonpolar membrane. Um, they are actually a substrate for p-glycoprotein. So it's it, basically if you have a fatty meal, you will um, saturate that protein. So instead of pumping the drugs back across the GI barrier, um, it will be saturated with fatty acids and you'll uptake more drug. So that will increase up to, up drug absorption. Um, but there's also a potential for drug-drug interactions. Uh, if you're taking, say, two different drugs, one of which is atorvastatin. Uh, atorvastatin is actually an inhibitor of PGP. So it'll get kind of stuck in there while it's trying to export it and it can't quite export it. So then it blocks that activity and that will increase the absorption of another drug. So that would affect dosing. Uh, but we're interested in modeling this. Um, we want to understand why um, different drugs will be exported by um, peak glycoprotein, but not some drugs. Uh, and then ultimately, um, us and others are interested in de designing inhibitors to, to block the efflux or to inhibit this protein. Uh, initially, the thinking in the field was that um, we want to inhibit it where the ATP binds. The ATP actually binds to these water-soluble domains uh, sticking inside the cell. Um, but it turns out the, the, the inhibitors that have been successful in, in studies are um, actually bind to the same spots as the drugs that are transported. Um, so this is actually not your typical um, drug binding pocket. So we're not trying to dock one you know, geometric molecule into a, in a, to a tightly bound, um, confined space. It's actually a large chamber. It has many different potential binding sites. Different drugs have been crystallized by our collaborators in different binding sites. <clears throat> uh, and actually, one crystal structure, they crystallize the protein with two drugs bound at the same time in different sites. So it's, it's a really complex, um, non-traditional um, drug you know, docking problem. Um, just to give you an idea of the size, um, you know, it's essentially, you've got room for um, not just multiple drugs, but multiple phospholipids. So cells are a bilayer composed of phospholipids. Uh, and what we think is, has been happening as we look at this more is that we think that the phospholipids are essentially solvating this large chamber and helping mediate the drug transport. Um, and various groups have been interested in um, the different types of phospholipids that make up cell membranes. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, and how that influences the health of the cell membrane. Uh, but in general, it just believes that there's you know, various lines of evidence that different lipids can help um, either help or hurt the activity of these transport proteins. So our model is good at looking at um, protein-lipid interactions and how that influences the function. Um, so what we're looking at here is a simulation um, data. Um, you're, I'm showing on the screen one structure. Uh, but actually in yellow and purple are the time average densities. So we ran a microsecond simulation 
Um, and now the protein is free to diffuse laterally. It wobbles around in the membrane, but we actually, um, in that microsecond simulation, we had 1,000 snapshots, 1,000 probably more, but um, we aligned the protein in the reference frame, its own reference frame, so we aligned them all together, and then we overlaid just the density of lipids. So this is a way of looking at weak binding events. Uh, in general, when you're docking a drug to a protein, you have a tight binding event, so that would show up um, either as a strong density or you would just have one structure that persists. This is actually one lipid here in the piece ball and chain model that persisted in a binded state. But in general, with these phospholipids, we have weak binding, so that's why we see these densities. <clears throat> um, and we compared um, two conformations. So we have the inward facing, so that's where it uptakes the, the substrate or the drug. Um, and then we have the outward facing conformation on the right. <clears throat> so after ATP, hyd ATP hydrolysis, it flips to an outward facing conformation. It spits that drug outside the cell. Um, in this case, we were just looking at the phospholipids and how that interacts in, during this process. Um, and we see basically nonspecific binding. Um, in yellow, we, those are known, it's known as a, an annular salvation shell or annular lipids. Um, and this is becoming a general theme when we've looked at, when other groups have looked at other membrane proteins, is that you can't separate the protein from the lipids, that they're, innerly, they're definitely interconnected. Uh, and then we do see specific binding interactions where in purple, these are the head groups. So these are charged. Um, they interact with charged sites of the protein. Um, in particular, we see um, in blue, so all of these sites in blue on the protein surface are basic residues. So they are positively charged. Um, and then they're going to basically provide a means for transporting negative substrates. And actually, the, um, one of the lipids that, we, um, that transports, is transported by these proteins has a negative head group. So that will become important. Um, so, so far I talked about P-glycor protein, so that's uh, in human cells, it's in the GI barrier, it's also um, throughout the tissues, um, but it turns out there is a homolog that we've been interested, that we've been studying um, in bacteria, and so this is in gram-negative bacteria, uh, it's known as lipopolysaccharide, so this is um, the actual outer membrane, what, this is what makes gram-negative bacteria pretty resistant overall, um, it's basically an impermeable barrier to drugs. Um, it gives it a protective coating. But what lipopolysaccharide is, is it's your traditional lipid. You can think of it as like a phospholipid, but it's got six chains, so it's a little bigger. Um, but then it has this long polysaccharide component. So that's a sugar chain. Uh, and then the sugar chain is water-loving. It's hydrophilic. So that's going to protect, um, protect you know, the cell from drugs. Drugs are generally uh, water-fearing. They're hydrophobic. Um, so essentially, that's the function of this LPS. So we were interested in just the first step of how, to the, how the transporter gets LPS from the inside. It's made inside the cell. It's got to get to the outside of the cell. Um, so if you could block that, this would be in a way of developing an antibiotic. Um, along the same lines, um, this transporter um, has, it's implicated in multidrug resistance in the sense that it can dr transport out drugs just like the human transporter. Um, it's not the main one. In terms of antibiotic resistance, there are other transporters as well. Uh, but we we're mainly interested into it. In, in, interested in it because it's, rel it's homologous to our human protein. Um, and so we could kind of make similar insights um, and find a common mechanism. <clears throat> so here we'll zoom in on the bacterial membrane. So this is the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. Um, this was actually an atomistic model that uh, one of our competitors constructed. Um, and you can really see the size of just how big the, um, the polysaccharide or the sugar component is to the membrane. Um, so they were running an atomistic simulation. So basically, the, by the time they took the effort to build this model, um, you know, and then they, they, they kind of simulated the dynamics. They could see ions. These are ions in green and purple. Um, it turns out these sugar chains are highly negatively charged. So they need calcium ions um, to basically counteract that charge and hold them together. Um, but with an atomistic model, you, it, it's really hard to go much further than that. What we're interested in with our coarse grain modeling, our multiple scale modeling, modeling is um, looking at the lateral diffusion of these lipids um, and how they mix um, and, and how they might associate with proteins. Um. <clears throat> so here we're going to um, just show you kind of the mechanism that we, we came up with for how um, the, the protein transporter itself um, transports or flips um, the lipopolysaccharide from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. So we start on the left, the, the lipid is facing inside. In red, we have the, the, the sugar moieties uh, with the phosphates are in red, they're negative. Um, and then they buddy up with these basic residues in blue, this is kind of this ring of arginines. Um, and then, then they basically follow that path um, out through the protein. So that's how it 
it's, it pumps out this lipopolysaccharide. And you can see there's kind of a gate on the other side, of just uh, two basic residues, one lysine, <coughs> um, that kind of mediates that. So initially, we were trying to think if we could find some rules that would, um, relationships that would explain why some drugs are transported, some are not, and then some drugs inhibit the actual transport action. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. I mean, it's really, um, it just, it's, this, this chamber is so big that it, we just, no one's really found any obvious rules. Um, but you could imagine you could exploit this, this positive patch, um, and somehow um, the inhibitors must be, you know, in, inhibiting that somehow where, um, you know, you can't transport something if that's not functioning. Uh, but the drugs that, that it transports are not all negative. That's where it gets complicated, right? The drugs really have no rhyme or reason. They vary in size, structure, geometry, and charge. Um, so that's where it gets a little more complicated. Okay, so I'll transition now a little bit. So um, if you remember, I mentioned that peak glycoprotein is involved in um, the GI barrier. <coughs> um, you can't really talk about the GI barrier without addressing um, the mucosa. So the mucosa is <clears throat> essentially this um, impenetrable region um, surrounding the membrane. Um, it's made up of mucin proteins, but actually the proteins are heavily glycosylated. So just kind of similar to that gram-negative bacteria, we have a, a sugar coat that's hydrophilic and kind of keeps things out. Um, and GI function is actually what it keeps out is um, bacteria. So we have um, your gut microbiome has um, about 200 prevalent species. Um, there's 2,000 in total, but 200 really are common in terms of large numbers of populations. They're generally um, can be, you know, they don't cause ill, cause you any harm. They're beneficial. Um, but what would be, um, you know, uh, problematic is if they encroach upon the mucosa. <clears throat> so if you look at various chronic diseases, we, a common theme is that, that the thickness of the mucosa gets decreased and the bacteria actually encroach um, into the membrane. And then if that happens, the, um, the membrane can become permeable um, both through the membrane and then through the tight junction proteins. In some GI disorders, those tight junction proteins um, are not expressed um, as in high enough amounts, so they become, um, essentially you become, you have this leakiness, it's known as leaky gut. <coughs> um, we see this in very chronic, various chronic diseases. <clears throat> um, but what, hap what can happen is metabolites of the bacteria, it's not, so, not to say that the bacteria are crawling through the barrier, um, but metabolites, so small molecules that they produce, will permeate through and enter the bloodstream, and then they can have ill effects. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, we want to model um, you know, the membrane um, properties to see you know, how this is influenced. And we know that the, the constituents of these actual cell membranes varies. That's what makes this problem so difficult. Um, the outer membrane, this is called the apical membrane, has a lot of glycolipids. Uh, for the phos and then for phospholipids, it has um, PE head groups and PC. They're both viterions, but the one's a little bit smaller, so it binds more tightly to charges. Um, but then if you look at the basal, even the basal, me basal lateral membrane of the epithelial has a different composition. It's basically flipped. You have more of the bigger head groups. Um, so one of the things we realized early on is that we had to um, make our model a little more sophisticated, a little more biological, biologically relevant, and start to not just include you know, a generic phospholipid, uh, zwitter ions, but we had to incorporate other lipids. Um, particularly, we had to add cholesterol, right? In eukaryotic membranes, cholesterol is a normal part of the functioning cell membrane. Um, so we had to uh, add that to our model. We had to add anionic lipids. Um, negatively charged lipids are often involved in signaling. Um, and basically, you know, every, you know, every so often we have to add new lipids, and that becomes its own project of developing a model that's realistic um, just for those lipids. Um, but what this is becoming a lot more interesting is uh, people are looking at the role of dietary lipids and how they get into the membrane. Um, so if you're familiar at all with fish oil, so fish oil are omega-3 fatty acids. <clears throat> um, there's evidence that um, if you're on a, you know, basically say a plant-based diet, so a healthier diet, Mediterranean diet, <clears throat> you're rich in omega-3s, those omega-3s will get gradually recycled into the plasma membrane. So they have an unsaturated double bond, three carbons from the last, the end of the chain. Um, first they get endocytosed, you know, you know, when you intake them in your diet, but gradually they will get recycled um, into the cell membrane as part of a normal turnover process. Uh, and it's thought as we get old that the, the cell membranes throughout your body, um, the tissues just forget to, to keep renewing the lipids. And so there's interest in what's called lipid replacement therapy. Um, it's already been shown to be successful for chronic fatigue syndrome. 
um, where you take an oral supplement of these nanoparticles containing phospholipids and omega-3s, uh, and they gradually can get renewed, um, particularly in the mitochondria. So as you get older and with fatigue syndrome, the mitochondria lipids need to be forget to turn over, um, and so you've got to have some way of basically jump-starting that. Um, but what's shown on this slide is kind of just a comparison of what we call the Western diet. So if you're aware of you know, chronic diseases becoming very common in Western nations, uh, the Western diet is high in omega-3s. So that's essentially this pathway. It's, it's inflammation promoting. <clears throat> um, if you have um, a lower, you know, lower intake of animal products, so more plants um, or seafood, you will, you will basically um, focus on the omega-3 pathway. So that's anti-inflammatory. So. These are different lipids, but also they, are, they become hormones where they have an inflammation response or not. <clears throat> um, they're essentially separate pathways. You can't convert an omega-3 to omega-6. Um, you can convert uh, omega-3s from plants into the omega-3s that fish oil make. Um, the exception is that those enzymes are shared with the other pathways. So if you're eating a lot of animal products or vegetable oils, <clears throat> they can become overwhelmed. So that's when supplementation might help you, although it's becoming pretty clear that over-the-counter supplements probably aren't going to get you there. Um, really, you would need prescription-grade omegas where they have, um, they're prevented from being oxidized, oxidized while they're storing. There's kind of some new evidence on that. <clears throat> um, but anyways, I'm in a pharmacy program. Um, I'm kind of trying to, you know, look at more health-related issues. You know, um, we have chronic disease is a big problem. It's a growing problem. Um, you know, every year when I teach new students, I get people coming up to me with, you know, these GI disorders I've never heard of. You know, they're becoming more common in the Western nations. Um, kind of my own personal interest is, you know, five years ago I developed IBS, so I kind of took more of an interest in this. Um, but there's basically a big connection between ver these various chronic diseases and um, the gut microbiome and intestinal permeability um, and then how that relates to diet. <clears throat> um, how it relates to metabolic syndrome is actually that <laughs> these LPS molecules get shed from gram-negative bacteria, um, and then you, you can identify in patients with diabetes, they have a more permeable intestinal, intestinal, intestinal barrier. So the LPS goes through the tight junctions into the bloodstream, uh, and it's what's called endotoxemia. It's an endotoxin, but also it's just a low-grade systemic inflammation. Um, so they've done in rats, they've injected them with LPS, and they can basically cause diabetes this way. Um, so there's definitely a clear connection there. Um, remember, the way the LPS got across the membrane is that the mucosa decreases and um, essentially the bacteria encroach upon the mucosa. <clears throat> so you can't really talk about the intestinal barrier without mentioning the microbiome. Um, for the different chronic diseases, um, they've tried to correlate, you know, initially was it one species, one disease? Um, you know, and that's the history of microbiology, right? Koch's postulate is you, you have to be able to isolate the bacteria and then, and then you know, put it in a he healthy individual or healthy animal to see if you reproduce the disease. Um, but with the microbiome, it's the community that's actually important. It's not necessarily one species over the other, although there are different species that become more populated in, say, Crohn's disease versus, um, you know, metabolic syndrome. They're trying to identify different species. Uh, but it's a community, and the, generally the, the general theme, if you compare a homeostasis in a healthy individual with gut dysbiosis, is that bacterial diversity declines. Um, you'll actually see viruses go up. Um, these aren't infective viruses that we traditionally think about. These are bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, so I think those are these um, path, well, I guess general pathogen, but it's just a cartoon. Anyways, um, alpha species diversity declines. So that means you have a few species taking over that go up in population. And then the general commensal ones, those 200 species, they decline and they become overtaken essentially by the overgrowing um, bacteria. Um, Crohn's disease, you get an immune response to those pathogenic bacteria, um, things like that. <clears throat> um, so just to sum that up, um, we have um, Another uh, research, I'll mention a few of my collaborators that we've been working with. Um, Steve Sutton in my department, uh, he has a, a model, a kind of an intestinal, intestinal model of this in vitro model. Um, and he's looking at um, just the, the um, influence of kind of low dose contamination from you know, food or environment, these hydrophobic nanoparticles, um, and how they get, you know, in uptake by our body and then what's that effect. Um, what other people have looked at food additives. You can see um, so maltodextrin, um, kind of a, I think it's an emulsifier just to, you know, kind of make things shelf life stable. Um, 
it will permeabilize uh, the membrane um, and allow you know, E. coli to essentially cut down on that mucosa. Um, leaky gut, um, <clears throat> polysorbate 80 is another additive um, that and others have been identified in that. Um, we're also kind of thinking, starting to think about how drugs influence the hydrophobicity of membranes. Uh, aspirin is, is a known you know, GI irritant, um, and there are various other drugs that people are starting to look at. Um, another issue are biofilms. So you have, um, when bacteria overgrow and contribute to these chronic diseases, um, they can basically, they secrete an exopolysaccharide. So remember I was talking about lipopolysaccharide, is that protective sugar coating. Biofilms are essentially the same thing. They're this heavily glycosylated um, region. And so this is why antibiotic resistance can be an issue, because the bacteria are protected by this film. They're a the community enclosed in this film uh, in red here. <clears throat> um, and then you can't get the antibiotic drugs through that, through that film, right? So just, I'll just show with, share with you a few anecdotes um, of success we've had in basically, or not we, but these are, uh, these are other groups of combating that film. Um, one, there's one study where they, um, they have these sugar cutting enzymes, this is kind of a brand new therapy, um, where they can degrade the exopolysaccharides, so this is just in the in, the in vitro stage, um, to get at the underlying bacteria. Um, but where else you see biofilms? Um, just while we're um, talking about them, you see them in dental plaque, UTIs, um, colorectal cancer. So in colorectal cancer, they've actually um, taken a patient with the cancer, <coughs> extracted the biofilm, um, kind of you know, cleaned it up, put it into a healthy mouse, and then they can see that they transmitted um, the, the cancer to the mouse. <coughs> so there's kind of, um, there's really, really good evidence along these lines. Um, biofilms are also involved um, if you're on, uh, say, your, your Western diet, but then you're very high starch, high sugar. You can, that can lead to what's called a candida overgrowth. So candida is a yeast. <coughs> um, it kind of can crowd out the bacteria. Um, and that can contribute to I mean, functional GI disorders, but if it, if it crosses the, the, the barrier into the blood, then that can lead to sepsis, which is um, pretty dangerous. <coughs> uh, here's just a picture of the study where they um, demonstrated causality of the biofilm transplantation um, into the mouse. <clears throat> so you see a lot of these studies where they're, this is how they demonstrate that the microbiome is related. In other ones, they extract the vagus nerve from, from the mouse, and then they see if, you, if the microbiome-related changes can transmit without the vagus nerve or with the vagus nerve. And there seems to be a, connection, a connection in, in, in various instances. Um, if you've heard of the gut-brain axis, they believe the microbiome is related to mental health. Um, via the metabolites, the short-chain fatty acids, um, getting into the bloodstream um, and influencing, they're basically hormones that influence um, physiology. Of course, you can't do the reverse experiment, right? You can't, you can't take a um, diseased mouth and put that into a healthy human, right? So this, these are kind of one-way causation experiments. <coughs> I don't know if you saw this in the news. Um, Claritin, so the allergy medicine, was actually, um, has been recently shown to um, break down biofilm. Um, and then it actually was used to, um, was used to <clears throat> kill off MRSA uh, in vitro. Um, so in other words, it's sensitizing the bacteria to beta-lactams just by breaking down the biofilm. So a lot of potential relevance that I think we'll be hearing a lot more about. <clears throat> uh, lastly, I'm in a college of pharmacy, so we're interested in um, you know, drugs, how drugs affect the body, um, this new study where it's becoming very clear that drugs are metabolized by the gut microbiome. Um, initially, we thought that um, you know, individuals experience different responses to medications, whether it's side effects or efficacy. Uh, we thought that was due to differences in liver enzymes. We thought that must be the case, whether it's genetic or otherwise. <clears throat> uh, but here they took um, 70 of the common bacterial, commensal bacterial strains in the, in the gut. Uh, and tested them against 300 different drugs, <clears throat> um, common drugs, you know, different classes. Um, and basically every single one of those strains would metabolize uh, between a dozen and a hundred different drugs. Uh, each strain metabolized different drugs, so it's a really complicated response. Some cases they activated, some cases they inactivated them. Um, in some cases they make a metabolite, which may be toxic or have toxic side effects. <clears throat> um, where this gets interesting to me is that we know that these strains can be upregulated in response to um, long-term diet or in response to chronic disease. 
And so if you could somehow map which strains are upregulated and what they do to different drugs, you would basically could predict um, how um, you know, the, the individualized response to drugs. We're a long way from getting there, of course. Um, what they have been able to predict is uh, glycemic response. So um, glycemic response has been shown to depend on many different things between individuals for different foods, um, one of which is bacteria, another which um, is um, you know, genetics. So they have these models where um, they can feed in all these parameters and basically predict um, an individual's res glycemic response to different foods, and they actually um, respond differently to different foods. It's pretty interesting. Uh, I think I have one more slide on the microbiome. This kind of we, we just published a kind of comprehensive review that um, this is why I'm really excited about, it, even though it's, it hasn't been directly into my area. Um, and we're trying to figure out how we can involve, um, get in more involved. But <clears throat> uh, if you remember the debate about you know whether eggs are you know contribute to health or to obesity, um, there's you know the yolks have cholesterol, and then there's a question of you know your body is 20% of the cholesterol is endogenous. 80% is, I said that backwards, 80% is endogenous made by the liver, 20% is what you consume. And so does that contribute to risk? So we focused a lot on cholesterol with uh, plaque formation, um, but then now there's this new, new molecule that we found out um, called TMAO. So where this comes from is uh, you start with choline, the dietary nutrients rich in eggs and animal products. It's, a, it's sold as a vitamin, right, it's a supplement. Uh, you can have choline deficiency, so you can't go without it. But what happens is the bacteria will ferment this into trimethylamine, and then your liver will, liver will turn that into something that's atherogenic called TMAO. <clears throat> um, they've, so there's been a lot of studies on this, and they, if you basically you can um, do a choline challenge. They've done choline challenge with humans. They can see them produce the TMAO, where you just feed them you know, choline or you feed them eggs. <clears throat> um, and then in animals, you know, essentially they've... <clears throat> basically accelerated, athero they have atherogenetic models of atherosclerosis in animals where they can accelerate this process to confirm it. <clears throat> so there's basically, this is a you know, pretty causal relationship here. Um, interestingly, there was one study where they looked at vegans, uh, and it turns out vegans didn't have the bacteria that ferments as much TMAO. So if you actually gave them the choline challenge, they didn't ferment the TMAO. So very interesting about how um, the microbiome relates to that. But anyways, they've, they're developing inhibitors um, you know, for this process to, to basically um, combat that. So um, yeah, so that, that just kind of sums up the relationship between um, diet and health and the microbiome. Um, for the last part of my talk, I'll talk about uh, these, uh, the work that two summer students have been doing this summer, um, Hillary and Alyssa. So they're third year pharmacy students. Um, and they've kind of been interested in this issue of we have um, statin medications are, you know, one of the top five prescribed drugs are just the proportion of adults is just growing and growing that are taking them. Um, and so they wanted to look at the, the, the efficacy of the health outcomes. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of start off with the outcomes that they've reviewed, some meta-analyses, um, and then I'll, I'll, get, I'll come back to the biochemistry of what's going on. So I'm going to kind of go backwards if that's okay. <clears throat> Um, but particularly, the, the evidence is, is a lot more controversial in the elderly. I mean, it's a lot weaker in the sense that, um, you know, for the younger folks, it, there's some strong cases to be made. But um, they wanted to do a kind of a comprehensive review of that. Um, in general, the early trials of statins um, demonstrating that, you know, they, well, they definitely lower LDL. Um, that's what they're made to do, right? They inhibit the cholesterol synthesis. But the question is, are they effective in clinical outcomes? Um, and most of the early trials combined primary prevention and secondary prevention. Um, you get a big benefit in secondary prevention, so someone who's had a heart attack is trying to prevent a second heart attack, active cardiovascular disease or stroke. Um, you know, the, there the outcomes are pretty convincing, uh, but we wanted to look at a stringent case. So I'm going to start off with the most stringent case is primary prevention in the elderly. Um, so typical metrics they would look at <coughs> are um, all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Um, and then you go, you go down through the different, um, different diseases. So whether it's chronic heart failure, CAD, um, you know, chronic coronary artery disease, or heart attack. <clears throat> um, you can see, so this is a forest plot um, where we're looking at individual trials. So they count the number of trials for each metric, and then they plot them all together um, where they plot the relative risk, so, or the risk reduction, the RR. So I'm sure you know what that is, but it's you compare the control group and then the treatment group, 
and you get a ratio of the probability of the outcomes in the two groups. So if you had, say, a 0.6 RR, <clears throat> um, that would say that you had a 40% reduction in the, the disease in the treatment group, right? So 0.6 would be good, 0.8 would be kind of modest, um, and then if it's close to one, um, you see basically no effect. So there's, if there's significant adverse effects, which we'll talk about later with statins, um, then you'd have to balance the benefits and the harms. Um, so anyways, what we see here, you see kind of the clustering around one um, for all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So there's really no overall benefit to mortality. Now I'm going to break it down in terms of diabetes patients um, in a later slide. Um, <clears throat> you do see some benefit. You definitely see a strong benefit with uh, myocardial infarction. So we're down to about 0.6 or 0.5 or even lower, uh, 0.4. <clears throat> um, heart for failure, it's right exactly on 1.0. There's really no benefit. This is over ages of 65, right? The whole plot, I should have mentioned that. So over 65, we see no benefit for heart failure. So kind of um, interesting, and I'm going to come back to that um, when we talk about the biochemistry. Um, coronary artery disease, you see about 0.8, so that's kind of modest. <clears throat> Um, but this was a meta-analysis of 23 random control trials um, over 65. Here we'll break it down and compare um, hazard ratios for the diabetes patients. Um, now hazard ratios are <clears throat> essentially an adjusted form of the relative risk, the RR. Um, they use a Cox proportional model, so they're trying to control uh, for independent risk factors. So say the treatment group and then the patient, the um, control group, they have different, say they have different um, you know, biometrics, different lipid counts um, that would make them prepen more propens, you know, have a greater propensity. So we, we correct for that, that's called the hazard ratio. But it's the same thing, it's a 1.0 scale. 0.8 is modest, 0.6 would be great. <clears throat> uh, but here, instead of 65, we're looking at 75 and up. Uh, and you see much more modest numbers. You do see some benefit for diabetes patients under 85. Um, but in this study, this was a study of, a uh, retrospective study, <clears throat> uh, about 40,000 patients. Um, but they saw that the statistical significance drops off for that benefit about 82, and then by 88, there's essentially no detectable benefit. Um, and why we're interested in this is just because there's, it's become, in the last decade or two, a lot more you know, octogenarians taking, taking statins. Um, so those are diabetes patients. You basically see no benefit um, with patients over 75 for um, patients without diabetes on the other hand. Um, now we're just looking at a cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality now. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of depressing. So we're going to kind of get into the biochemistry and kind of give a little more, some more constructive insight into what might be going on here and how we can address that. Um, one of the most promising things is, um, you know, if I, you know, I didn't tell you the history of statins, but statins are, can lower LDL by 50%, so that's the best feature of them. Um, but the question is, are the baseline LDL levels, are they a predictor of cardiovascular disease? And it turns out they're not the best predictor. We have other predictors that are much better, and they can be determined not too expensively in the lab, um, but it is just a matter of adopting them, and we've just recently learned about them, one of which is the um, calcium score. So. Uh, patients, uh, this, again, these are, this is data for primary prevention, no history of a heart attack, um, but if you just give them a CT scan and you measure the area and density of their calcified plaques, um, this actually turns out to be one of the best known predictors of um, cardiovascular disease. For an elevated score of over 100, um, you get basically a 0.3 hazard ratio, so 70 <clears throat> percent um, reduction. Um, Okay, now I gotta explain what these charts are. So this is a, a more detailed study um, where they're comparing hazard ratios of statin users versus non-statin users, depending on whether they had calcium plaques, calcium score, or not, right? And we, we find is the statins are not effective if you don't have a calcified plaque, um, but if you do, then the statins become effective and they become more effective. Um, you get a better benefit um, down to a 0.3 hazard ratio for an elevated plaque. Okay, so I'm <clears throat> going to try to address now the biochemistry of that. Um, we were just talking about calcium earlier, so I, I, um, we've been interested in modeling the interactions of calcium with the cell membrane um, just from our other work, but it has really nothing to do with those calcified plaques, but um, we just had some stimulating discussions. <clears throat> um, calcium is also involved with um, you know, joint health, right? arthritis, so we're interested, we're starting to think about how we can model the membranes, 
involved in the synovial fluid. So that's where you get arthritis, um, tendonitis. Um, but in, and again, they have, it's not just the membrane you have to worry about, it's these, um, the collagen and these, these basically um, polysaccharides is, that lubricate those joints. Um, but now we're going to get back to, the, to talking about the biochemistry of cholesterol. So what statins do, they inhibit the rate limiting step of the pathway that makes cholesterol, that's HMG-CoA reductase. And so what they're doing is they're stopping the synthesis of your endogenous cholesterol, right? So at any time, 80% of the cholesterol in your body is made from your liver as, to, as opposed to what you ate recently, right? Um, you know, another interesting question is um, they've looked at if you're on a high cholesterol diet, it actually goes, gets recycled into the cell membrane. Um, but that's not what we're going to talk about. Um, you can kind of see I have these, these competing, these broad interests, and they're kind of, they interface, but they don't quite interface. So I'm a little, little scatterbrained here. But all right, so the other thing that, that happens when you inhibit cholesterol synthesis is that you inhibit, inhibit the natural substrate and the mitochondria, coenzyme Q. And we're going to come back to where that's important. Um, there's been controversy about, you know, whether we know that statins decrease the body's levels of CoQ, but there's been controversy about whether there are any health outcomes associated with that. <clears throat> um, but the whole point here was that statins lower LDL, but that's really, it's just one, com one type of cholesterol in the body. Um, we're, now we're taught in class that there's only four types of cholesterol, HDL, LDL, um, and then VLDL and IDL, or kilomicrons, I guess there's five. Uh, but it's really even more complicated than that. There's really a continuum of, um, <clears throat> and there's these different species they've studied, you know, which is the most, most plaque forming, the most atherogenic. atherogenic atherogenic. Um, and it turns out different types of LDL are atherogenic, um, and in particular the smaller particles, and then um, also the cholesterol remnants. So they don't even have a category, they're just called remnant cholesterol is, is the new way of, um, the new thing they're studying. But if we just look at the LDL particles, so when we measure serum cholesterol, what we're doing is we're measuring um, the milligrams per deciliter. So we're measuring the passengers on the road. Um, but what it turns out is what's actually plaque forming is the number of cars on the road, so the number of particles. Um, you can either determine that by counting the apolipoprotein B, because there's one of these protein receptors on each particle, um, or you can count, generally you can count the numbers of small LDL particles. Those correlate pretty well. And it turns out these small, small particles are more atherogenic, <clears throat> um, and it's just the number of particles. So these are actually better risk factors, or better predictors of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> um, and um, basically, you know, statins will lower the, the whole proportion of LDL, but they don't alter the ratio. So they, they're not getting as much benefit as, as theoretically possible, because if we could just, they don't alter the ratio of small to large buoyant LDL. Um, and interestingly, you know, they, if you just kind of survey the history, you know, there's this, we've seen these themes emerging. Um, the, the, the risk calculator that we use in de deciding whether to prescribe a statin um, you know, it's been around for a while. It was last updated in 2008. They actually had to, at that year, they had to drop LDL from the calculator because it did not help improve their predictions. Um, they also <clears throat> basically had to drop body mass index. Um, it's just not a great predictor. Um, there is a, an alternative measure to body mass index. Does anyone know what it is that's more a better predictor? Waist to hip ratio. So it's pretty easy to get, and we just, we just haven't been doing it. <clears throat> um, so one of the first, I'm kind of going, telling the story backwards, but one of the first things we were interested in and looking at was do LDL, baseline LDL levels, even correlate with mortality uh, in adults over 60? And so this has been controversial again, um, but basically, um, if you look at the data as a whole, it inversely is associated. Um, so really paradoxical, but more recent studies suggest it's not the level, so in the elderly level, it's not the exact level, it's changes that are indicative of a health problem, right? <coughs> uh, the last years of life, you have a drop in total cholesterol and LDL, so that's going to correlate with mortality. In cancer or severe disease, you have a, a drop in cholesterol and LDL. Um, there's a study in Korea where actually um, if you change from the second tertile to either the first or the third within a two-year period in adults over 40, that correlated with uh, mortality. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than, than um, just looking at LDL. Um, here's some of those data just looking at LDL baseline levels over 60. Um, you see as you get to the fourth quartile, so the highest levels of LDL, lowest to the first quartile, 
you have up to a 50% <coughs> or a two-fold increase in mortality, I'm sorry, decrease in mortality um, with those higher LDL levels. Okay, so now if you remember back with that very first meta-analysis I showed you, we had a 1.0 hazard ratio for um, heart failure, so statins in the elderly, does that uh, affect heart failure? Well, if you remember the, the mechanism of action of statins is it, it um, stops the, the mevalonate pathway. That decreases serum levels of coenzyme Q in the mitochondria. The mitochondria have to produce ATP for your muscles to function. <clears throat> Um, there's been studies that have correlated um, decreased serum CoQ levels correlating with heart failure. These are in, this is independent of statin use, the, the very, very first study, um, just correlating whether patients had a lot of CoQ or not in their, in their heart muscle. Um, and then since they've gone on to supplement, uh, it's just a dietary supplement, the, student, the, sorry, the patients take two to 300 milligrams of CoQ a day. And then they, they did up to 10-year studies where they look at um, the outcome of heart failure. It's reduced by 50% if you take this CoQ. Um, now, if you know the history of statins, um, the drug companies have known about the CoQ effect, right? The first patent from Merck, they had, um, it was the statin formulated with CoQ. Um, so they, the patent was successful. That's in, you know, published part of the record, but the FDA, of course, said, oh, that's a supplement. We can't, we can't deal with that. You need to just sell the statin. And so the, the CoQ kind of gotten forgotten. They've, they've since studied whether CoQ would affect um, muscle, ad, adverse muscle effects in statins. So that's the most common adverse effect in statins. So in the elderly, this is an issue. You could have weakness. You could have falls. Um, you know, myopathy is an issue. So there's been, there were some small trials with CoQ looking at myopathy, but they were kind of inconclusive. There's a lot of controversy. A brand new study where I think they've really, they've really tied it all together and, and shown what's going on here. Um, it's really the best translational study that, that I'm aware of. You know, in my field, we've used that buzzword quite a bit. You know, I'm a you know, physical chemist. You know, how do I get my research to be more clinically relevant? And it, to me, it's just too much to do both things at the same time. But this is just a really good example. Um, they started out with a, a myoblast cell line. So they're doing a, an in vivo model, but in, you know, on a plate. <clears throat> they take the myocyte, myocytes, um, they show that statins <clears throat> um, decrease the CoQ, but also decrease cell respiration and basically cause muscle toxicity. And then they took patients in the clinic with <clears throat> um, confirmed myalgia, statin-associated myalgia. They extracted biopsies from the muscle, uh, and then they looked at those. Um, and, and basically, what they found um, was pretty convincing. Um, they found a mechanism of action. Um, so in the myoblast, they see that it's not the, the, the active statin form, it, which is a carboxylic acid. It's actually a chemical conversion or a metabolite known as the lactone. So it's a cyclic ester of the acid. The lactone forms an off-target target reaction. The lactone actually binds in the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So this is our mitochondrial membrane. <coughs> um, the lactone form will compete with coenzyme Q um, in order to undergo cell respiration and to form ATP. So they showed, um, you know, in the muscle line that you get decreased cell respiration. Um, but then in the, with the muscle biopsies, they just added coenzyme Q <coughs> so that they could outcompete this competitive interaction and then they could reverse the myopathy. Now the catch was they didn't use the CoQ we've been using for 10 to 20 years in these small studies. They used ubiquinol which is the reduced form, or the CoQH2. So it turns out ubiquinol is an antioxidant, a general antioxidant in the cell. It's a lipid, it's a lipid anchored um, you know, chain that inserts in the, in the leaflets, almost like, a, almost like an omega-3 or phospholipid. Uh, but anyways, it turns out that the redox form um, is essentially needed because you need to pump electrons in to outcompete the statin. So far, um, there's only been one study using reduced CoQ, um, and it was literally, it was, they started with 120 patients, but actually only 30 completed it, um, and they predicted that to really prove that the CoQ reduces myopathy in the clinic, they'd need 700 patients. So we basically just need larger, um, more effective trials, well-controlled trials, um, but I, I think they're making pretty good process, progress. So if you imagine you have a statin reduces CoQ, and then you can supplement that with uh, the reduced CoQ, you can take care of myopathy, but also the heart failure. Uh, and maybe you, then we will show that you get a better um, long-term clinical outcome with statins in the elderly um, for primary prevention. <clears throat>
Um, just some other highlights. Um, so the, have you guys heard of the US? Raise your hand if you've heard of the US Preventative Services Task Force. So this is sort of an independent panel that makes its own recommendations separate from the guidelines. So they've been kind of reviewing the evidence as well. Um, and, then, and basically what they're promoting now is um, they're trying to promote this idea of raising the threshold. So when you put someone in the risk calculator, we know that it overestimates because actually if you put anyone who's over 75 through it, they will get, statins will be supported, right? Even if they had optimal lipids. So they're trying to raise that threshold from 7.5 to 10% to correct for that. Um, and then they've, they've basically been interested in this um, for a while. Um, other resources that the medical students might be interested in are the NNT.com. Do we know what NNT is? Number needed to treat. So for any drug, you go to that resource, you can look up uh, how many patients you need to treat in a year to get to benefit one patient. So if it's over 100, that suggests you it's not very efficacy, not very efficient, not very effective. Um, if you get a number around 12, of course, that would be good. Um, so again, th this statin work was done by Hillary and Alyssa. Um, two, I've had two undergrads working with me, Jess and Kate, some of you may know. Um, I actually didn't get to talk about their work. They were looking at calcium interactions with membranes. <clears throat> um, and then previously I've had um, some other students, but I also want to mention that the statin work is a collaboration with a brand new pharmacy professor we just hired, very excited about, uh, Sydney Springer. Her uh, area, and now this is an area I hadn't even heard of, um, it's called depre, I said it wrong already, Deprescribing. Did I say that right? Deprescribing. So polypharmacy and the elderly, she specializes in geriatrics, um, looking at how do you wean people off medications as they get older, because there's several medications that are on the beers list where they're just not indicated for the elderly. Um, but yeah, so thank you for your attention. That's all I have. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question about the ABC transporter okay. that you talked about. So whenever I think of ABC, I always think of that story where the mice in a research setting were treated with ivermectin and a subset of the mice died and it was because they had a mutation in the ABC transporter uh -huh. that they it, basically the drug crossed the blood brain barrier and so we identified this mutation and now we've seen in humans there are a number of SNPs and we don't completely understand uh, the clinical implication of these SNPs in ABC um, but there may be some association between colitis and ABC mutation so I'm just wondering in your computational model have you looked at any of these SNPs and how they may affect binding or transport yeah, so uh, the first thing she mentioned was the natural native function of the, the P glycoprotein is to pump substances across the blood-brain barrier that don't, don't want to be there, xenobiotics. Um, and so we, not much is known about really why that's important. We know that fatty acids in the GI are, are pumped out. Um, and actually we had an interesting discussion this morning, morning about how lipids can go awry in the brain. And so now I'm, I'm wondering if, um, you know, basically they're involved, some of those xenobiotics or fatty acids that are important. Because So she was referencing a study where if you knock out the ABC, you can't survive without it. So when, when they design inhibitors, you can't, you, you don't want to inhibit it completely. You'd want to localize it to the GI. Um, now, remind me what a SNP is. I'm a little fuzzy on that. A single nucleotide polymorphism. So populations who are, somehow have the ABC1 Modified, okay. yeah. Yeah, and you, I, thought, I, thought you, I thought you said del deleterious mutation, is that right, or? I don't know which mutation, I just know that yeah. there are some studies that it's implicated in colitis. Yeah, no, I haven't seen the colitis study. So that would be in the GI barrier. So now we're talking, not talking about the blood-brain barrier. Um, that's interesting, because I did not, I've never heard, I've never seen a study where PGP was implicated in um, any GI issues. So I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. It's possible that if it's involved in fatty acid transport, that that's mediating inflammation. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we had one over here. Yeah. Just as far as like practical advice for like us or patients is concerned, can you comment on like an optimal omega three omega six ratio? And kind of a follow up question to that. Um, what is more important of like the ratio versus like how much you're getting of each from like a volume perspective? Yeah, so he's mentioning the omega-3, omega-6 ratio. So 
Uh, it's thought that the Western diet is 10 to 1 in favor of omega-6. So most vegetable oils um, have like a 10 to 1 ratio. They're pretty bad about that. Uh, olive oil is a little better. Avocado oil is a little better, for instance. Um, there's some history. So the, the people that follow you know, the paleo diet, you know, they, they think that the, our ancestors followed a 1 to 1 ratio which is ideal, but it's, so, it's like impossible to achieve today, I would, I would say. So now they say a four to one ratio of omega-6s to threes is good. It's always more omega-6s, you just want to reduce the amounts. Um, is that just because it's difficult? Like if, in theory, if you had like someone just like locked up and you could just feed them whatever you wanted for optimal health, uh, like what, what sort of ratio would you choose? Yeah, well the paleo folks would say one to one, but we have no clinical evidence, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah, no data on that, yeah. Um, well, I, for me, I would just be looking at the cell membranes, what ratios, you know, and, and we're just simple models, so I wouldn't know what to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great talk. Um, so for your 3D modeling um, for proteins that are dependent on uh, their, their folding as they're embedded in the lipid bilayer, where do you get the data if, they're, if you're dependent on X-ray crystallography that's not 3D, uh, not lipid bilayer embedded? Yeah. So um, they, so he's asking about how do we, for our simulations, we need a starting structure. Um, and for soluble proteins, you'd use a crystal structure. Um, so our collaborators now are pretty, they're pretty good at um, that what they have is, um, it's not a vesicle, it's not a liposome, it's kind of a hybrid, and I forget the name right now. It's like an ellipsoid of lipids. So they crystallize these ellipsoid of lipids around the protein. Um, and actually, it's, we, we believe it's pretty native-like. I mean, there have been NMR measurements where they compare the different distances. Um, but also, they, when they crystallize these, they have crystallized annular lipids um, around coating the protein. So these lipids are locked into a binding site. And then when we run the simulation, you can see those annular lipids persist. Um, it's harder to see with this vitrionic lipids, but with an, a negatively charged lipid, you can see the ones that are necessary for function. Um, it's a very specific binding event, and that's captured in the crystal. So we're pretty confident um, with um, some of the new, 20 years ago we weren't confident, but now we're pretty confident, yeah. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.